awesome episode of Rebellion's educational series with retired Captain Jeff Klein of the Navy. He's the professor of practice of the Naval Warfare Studies Institute. Really just brilliant mind when it comes to where the Navy is going, what's happening with the future of the Navy, and what we're going to see. Captain, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. So first, will the robotic era of the Navy allow us to continue to compete with all the other countries, and specifically China? Or will this be the time when you know, we have issues? I think it's a great question. Right now, uh, we're in the age of competition. And that's been designated by our nation's leadership and recognized in the Pentagon. Uh, we have, uh, are in a race, I think, toward um, leveraging in, in artificial intelligence, uh, unmanned systems, in order to enter that age of robotic warfare. Uh, it's not clear that the United States has the lead in all aspects in this area. Uh, and because of that, um, the use of unmanned systems uh, in order to enhance distributed type operations uh, for, uh, uh, for both deterrent and warfare purposes uh, is an important research area. Uh, the Secretary of Defense just came out with a Battle Force 2040 that said what his vision uh, would look like, and it included unmanned and, and manned pairing uh, in certain operations. I think it's almost critical now that we jump into this uh, headlong and use uh, all our research talent in order to start to move this direction. But the Navy is such a bureaucratic organization. How can it move forward? China is something that at Rebellion we've studied intensely. We've had uh, many, many students from China, still have many students living in China, uh, many with relatives in the Chinese military. And China has developed an extensive array of unmanned submarines, but they can't last more than two hours without going back. And by the way, that's been a constant theme at Rebellion's educational series. All of our robotic CEOs say the number one handicap for unmanned vehicles is battery power, which right now it's like two to 24 hours, depending on your vehicle. So until you know, we make headway with battery power, all unmanned vehicles will be concerned by that. Is that something you'd agree with? Yeah, I, I would agree with them. And I'd uh, like to address your first question. Um, throughout history, it's just not the US Navy. Throughout history, large established navies are very difficult to change. Why? Because there's a bureaucracy that's built around them. There's processes for maintaining that uh, bureaucracy. Uh, for example, in our process for finding out what we're going to fund uh, in the future fleet, we go through the planning, um, uh, programming, budgeting, and uh, execution system, or PBVE. That process itself, plus the many bureaucracies that support and plan for the Navy, inspire marginal change, uh, mainly because of the large capital investment that we have in our current fleet and the processes that we go through it. Uh, what will be demanding, I think, uh, of or what would be required for us as and to the entire Department of Defense actually, is a hard look at reorganizing that to give power to uh, certain individuals, have both the vision and the acquisition and the employment capabilities. We've had people like this before. Grace Hopper brought in uh, the era of computation to the Navy. Uh, Myers, uh, Admiral Myers brought in the Aegis Combat System. Uh, Rick Over brought in the Nuclear Navy. We need someone like that with the authority and power in order to expand or uh, span those bureaucracies to bring this robotics age to, uh, uh, vision uh, to reality. Now the CNO, I think, Chief of Naval Operations recognizes this. He just kicked off something called Project Overmatch. He's tasked several admirals with start to wrestling with this. And I think we're moving in the right direction. Getting down to the technical side, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and I think the CEOs in the robotics areas are as well. We need to find different power sources or ways to power our capabilities. And at the Naval Postgraduate School, we're looking at uh, potential wave action uh, in order to actually generate electricity for long stay uh, unmanned systems. Uh, we're taking a look at uh, solar capabilities to recharge batteries. And of course, we're doing advanced uh, um, uh, work in lithium batteries to try to extend those as well. So in a way, when you talk about the platforms themselves, the unmanned platforms, it's almost uh, the competition is at the energy level. You're absolutely correct. But you know, what happens when we build the best vehicles? The Bismarck, for instance, was such an amazing 
piece of war machinery, but you know how it was deployed wasn't the most intelligent method. And so you, know, you think about Matthew Broderick's War Games from 1984 and how it took the computer a few minutes to learn that it would always lose a, you know, an ICBM war. You know, could the Bismarck deployment have been done in an efficient manner had an AI system been in charge of that? Yeah, so it's a great question. Now you're branching into um, how much trust we want to give an AI system, uh, whether we're talking about general AI or specific AI. Um, and, and, and I think right now we're pretty well uh, convinced that we're able to, in certain mission areas, provide uh, artificial intelligence to specific areas. General artificial intelligence, I think, is still out there. And the question that you're asking is still relevant, uh, whether and how much trust we give that particular system. Uh, but for example, let's take something like a, a sauna buoy, a passive sauna buoy. That's this thing that, that drops out of a P8. Uh, it's a, it simply sits in the water. It listens for noise. Um, some programming could be installed in that little system that, uh, uh, that is able to distinguish one noise from another, maybe do onboard sensors, it's called brilliant sensors. Uh, potentially think if you give it swimming capability, uh, the, uh, the knowledge to relocate, to maintain contact on that particular noise source. So that sort of focused artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think uh, is still applicable and where we're making advancements today and trying to envision how to employ those. The larger concept, um, uh, in, in the end, however, your point is very good. In the end, someone makes a decision, whether that's the programmer, whether that is the machine learning algorithm, uh, or whether it's a human in override mode to actually direct that system. And I think that's necessary to build those networks, but we have to build them from bottom up. And what I mean by that is many people think about this overarching command and control. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the fictional name now of of, uh, of the, the whopper. Uh, yeah, exactly. That controlled everything, right? That's not the way to look at this. The way to look at this is start with very small and work your way up. That is local control of particular unmanned systems in order to build resilience throughout the entire system so that during conflict, if one or two areas are hit, your entire system is not hit. And uh, that's the concept of distributed maritime operations, uh, expeditionary advanced basing that the Marine Corps and the Navy are looking at now. Excellent. So I've got to ask, what is the future of submarines if we'll have thousands of unmanned drones? I mean, these gigantic submarines that we've built with our nuclear warheads, won't Russia and China be able to know where these submarines are at all times? Well, I still have confidence that uh, in our uh, second, uh, our strategic arm uh, as far as uh, being quiet and, and where they're located. And we've built in uh, backup systems as well. But your point about rethinking that entire strategic uh, uh, insurance is important um, because we don't know where the future will take us. And we don't, and one concept is we may be putting too many eggs in one basket, whether that's an aircraft carrier or whether it's an advanced Arleigh Burke destroyer or whether it's a, a submarine, ballistic missile submarine. And so maybe we need to rethink about how potentially uh, to provide assured second strike, which is a way of saying uh, a d strategic deterrence uh, against a potential first strike by a potential adversary. Um, and because of the, uh, the very fact that you're talking about many unmanned systems out there, many d uh, sensors, will the ocean become transparent? That's uh, becoming more and more of a potential uh, uh, possibility, and we need to start rethinking exactly how we provide those. Uh, but for now, I, th I think uh, as we see the Chinese and Russians continue to build their own strategic ballistic missile submarines uh, that uh, our, our secondary, or our, I'm sorry, our strategic assurance is still safe, uh, at least for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. Well, as we learned from the Maginot Line, the least mobile military is the most susceptible. So clearly submarines are going to be a, an immense part of the future of warfare. The question is how big? how fast, how much protection will they need, like the Bismarck. You know, had the Bismarck been deployed with the proper protection in the proper area, things could have been very different. Well, speaking of history, Captain, is there an admiral like Nimitz that has inspired you or a military conflict throughout history that's you know, piqued your curiosity and that led you down the 
line to be a seller? Yeah, I would say actually uh, Admiral Spruance uh, from World War II. Uh, he was the author of, um, uh, well, he was a tactical commander in the Battle of Midway. Um, his uh, actions there, plus his follow-on uh, campaigns through uh, the Pacific War, he was both a thinker and a warrior. And so because of that, uh, I, I sort of patterned myself uh, or like to pattern myself after his model and to think that we have to think first before we employ and we have to go through the hard work of, of, um, of design, thinking how that design might be employed and then actually uh, go for that operational employment of those systems. So Admiral Spruance, definitely if people have, uh, if your audience haven't read any bios on him and are interested, I'd pick up a book on Admiral Spruance. Wonderful. Well, this has been just an awesome episode. I, I couldn't be more thankful, Captain. And uh, you stay safe during these crazy times, okay? All right.